Welcome to Wine Notes, where we take the idea of a tasting note and expand upon it by highlighting the people and their stories from vineyard to glass. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Jessica Mazeko of FE Wines. In 1984, her dad was making wine from their garage. We talk about the back of the envelope origin story and the four easy steps of winemaking. With family being the backbone of FE, we dive into father and daughter bonding over wine bubbling Monday, and exploring the vineyards with Jessica's daughter, to name just a few. Our conversation sheds light on Jessica, the winemaker, business person, single parent, and the nicest person in Oregon wine country. So pour yourself a glass of wine, enjoy, and be sure to stay tuned until the end for our grand reveal of our blind tasting. Cheers. <music> Jessica for coming on today. I really appreciate your time. I uh, thought we'd pour us a little bit of wine to kind of, you know, um, enjoy and talk about throughout our conversation. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you for coming, AJ. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, I have to tell you, the, uh, the first time I heard of you in wine country, I was sharing an Uber with Dave and Lars. Mm -hmm. We drove by the, the front of the tasting room and Lars was like, have you met Jessica yet? I'm like, no. Oh, you've got to meet Jessica. She is the most nice person in the world. And I told her that, you know, there's a little bit of a competition between, you know, her and now, you know, Janice at Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and what Laura said was like, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, you have quite the reputation out there for being <laughs> such a, a nice person. That's uh, such a welcome thing out here in the, in the in the world that we live in. So oh, thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. It, um, as I told you, it made my mother laugh very <laughs> hard. She thought it was hysterical. Right. But yeah, I'm up for the challenge. Well, very nice. Well, cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much for bringing wine to share. Yes, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. So you're not going to tell me anything about what this is, right? No, I will. I will reveal it toward the end. Mm -hmm. You know, and just like it's to enjoy. It's mm -hmm. to just you know. Uh, a lot of times, these are all about wine. So let's take the wine out of the focus and yeah. talk about the humans behind the wine. Excellent. Yes. Thank, well, thank you. you. This is a really pretty shard. It's it is. lovely. It is it's one really of, pretty. It's one of my favorite shards mm -hmm. um, from the 2019 vintage. Mm -hmm. And it has some nice minerality to it. The oak gives it structure, but not too much. Doesn't overpower it. Really pretty. Yes. Um, so outside of wine country, yeah. you also have a little bit of a reputation as well. And uh -oh. I quote this not, right? <laughs> Jessica, she's elegant, she's humble, and wicked smart. Oh my gosh, I want to know where this came from. She's kind of a badass. <laughs> right? Um, you know, so I, I'm again. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, reading on your backstory. You know, with your with your dad. Yeah. Um, there's so much there, right? The, but really, the you know the one question that constantly you know kind of comes up to the top mm -hmm. of my mind is the envelope, right? That you know your dad wrote down the four instructions. From what I can tell, there wasn't any information passed along with those four instructions. Were the envelope sounds like it was thrown away. Did you give your dad any crap about like, what the heck? Yeah, why don't I have the envelope? How right. come when they interview me for Oregon Wine History Archive, I can't say, oh, I, have, I have the envelope? Right. I mean, that'd be amazing to have the envelope like, up here on the wall I or know. something. Well, it was such an afterthought. So it all started with the envelope. That's how our path into wine started. We had moved from um, Hawaii to Oregon, and this is in 19, well, uh, 1978 and yes because the as I recall the trailblazers had just won so we thought we were you know moving to basketball country right. and uh, anyway so we moved in 1978 and uh, my dad was a software engineer and he started enjoying wine just 
for fun, just to appreciate it. And one year for an anniversary present, my mom gave him a present of a wine tasting class uh, with Matt Kramer, and then he just started from there taking wine tasting class. So he was just appreciating it as a consumer. And um, he was always in the garden just for fun. And a neighbor said, I see you're always in the garden. I have some extra, I don't know, there's sticks. Uh, from this guy named um, David Lett, he gave me some grapevines and I have some extra, so why don't you just stick them in the ground and see what happens? Right. So he did that and you know, three years later my dad said, so I think it's ready, what do I do? And the neighbor said, oh, winemaking is really easy. There are only four simple steps. You can just make the wine. Oh, and my dad had just gotten the mail, so he had a, um, he had a, the bills. I mean, he had the mail in his pocket and he ripped, he pulled a bill out and just said, what, what are the four simple steps? And wrote right. down the four simple steps. And that started the pathway uh, to wine. So our journey really was um, that he started as a home hobbyist just for fun. And when I was growing up, I always helped him in the garage and with our tiny backyard uh, vineyard. Right. And never thought that it would become anything other than something that was enjoyable. But he did that for 20 years. And after doing that for 20 years, he called me at my job, which I was working in biotechnology in right. San Francisco. And he said, so I, I want to start a winery. And I said, that's great. You should go do that. You're so passionate about it. It's terrific. Right, right. And he said, well, I think I would want a partner. And so we started it together. I had certainly never had wine on my radar, um, but I didn't think he'd do it unless I did it with him. So we started it together almost 19 years ago, 2003. That's awesome. In, in all those moments of wine, right? Uh, you know, it sounds like that your mom doesn't uh, drink wine or anything. Mm -hmm. No, she always says she's allergic to it, which is <laughs> code for I don't try anything. That's fair. <laughs> but she has an excellent nose. She smells everything, can give great feedback. There are right. times when I'm either writing notes or trying to make a technical decision and I'll just ask her for her aroma right. perspective. No, that, that's awesome. How did, like, how did the bond between you and your dad start with wine? Yeah. Well, I think it's because my mom doesn't drink that um, because my dad, by the time I started to get older, he was so excited to have somebody that appreciated wine with him. And it became absolutely the glue for us right. of what we talked about, what we analyzed, what we went out and tried to find together. We spent my 21st birthday in Burgundy, which oh. was a tremendous gift. Right. I was, um, well, I was a science major undergrad and I saved up all my elective classes for one semester to go to Italy. And I completed my junior year um, spring in Italy and my dad said, well, why don't we meet you and we'll drive up through France. And so we spent my 21st birthday in Burgundy. Oh my and so there's no possibility that you could not be completely immersed and interested and passionate about wine. Of course, there, there's no way. And I, I can almost um, envision your mom probably at times it's like the two of you just need oh, to yeah, go exactly I'm sure in fact when we wanted to start the winery um, she we had a lot of family conversations about this is your thing and you guys are gonna start this whole big project and it's gonna create a lot of work for me are you really sure you want to do that <laughs> <laughs> but after that I mean she's been tremendously supported right. supportive but I feel just really lucky that I had that experience. Um, it fundamentally changed my relationship with my dad completely right. because we had this one thing that we were both so excited about and we wanted to share together. And then that spilled over into other elements of our lives where we wanted to share a lot of things with one another. That's amazing. It's uh, that bond, right? It's yeah. just... I mean, I have so many memories of whether it was sort of trade tastings or trade technical tastings or the social component afterwards or anything right. that it was you know when you think of peak moments in your life like this is one of those moments that i'm never going to forget right. where we'd be so excited to be trying things and talking about it and i feel so blessed that i had that opportunity yeah. no that's absolutely amazing and then you know after your dad passed in april of 2017 yeah. You know, 
the wine community just kind of helped and kind of came out and, and helped you, right? I, um, I won't forget the first time I met Bill Holler, right? I was going up for a tasting, you know, the first time at Holler, and, you know, I was getting ready to go up the stairs to go up to the tasting room, and there's this guy walking down, and just out of random, I was, I had no idea who he was, and I'm like, so how was, how was the tasting? Was it, was it good? And he's like, I hope it was good. I'm, I'm the owner. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> humble. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Um, so it, it's just amazing how he kind of just brought you in yeah. to the, you know, the, the new facility. And I think the exact word was, you know, if you need a change. Yes. You know, that's just. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, my dad died extremely suddenly and unexpectedly. It was a tragic accident. Um, in fact, the morning he died while he was um, going out on to work in the vineyard on the tractor. And that morning we had, my daughter was a little over a year, a year and three months, and maybe a year and a half. And um, we had spent the night at my parents' house. And um, in the morning, my dad and I were frantically talking about what we had to do that day. And I said, right. well, I'm coming back, we're coming back for dinner anyway. So I'll, I'll talk to you about it later tonight. I have to go. Right. And, um, and then I didn't know that was gonna be the last time I mm -hmm. saw him, of course. Right. And after he died, uh, the community absolutely stepped up. So one of the things that um, Bill Hatcher mm -hmm. is, um, has always been a very close family friend. We invited, we had a viewing for my dad and um, there were only, I think, six people there and Bill was one of them. And he drove me to my, this is the day after he died, and he drove me to the car, my car, the next day and he right. said, I said at some point we're going to have to talk about what I'm going to do about the business. Like, can I really go on without him? Right. And he said, so no one's ever going to replace your dad, ever. But I'm here to tell you that you are never going to feel alone in whatever decision you make. Right. If you choose to go on, I will be here for whatever sounding board I can be. Right. Um, and he meant it and lived it. And so after that, he showed up every week at my house for a month or two right. to just help me put one foot in front of the other and say, you need to release this wine. You need to uh, pay these bills. You need to get a new blah, blah, blah. I mean, it just right. was amazing. And one of those decisions was exactly what you're referencing is that Bill Holleran, who owned La Pavillon Vineyard that we had just actually been working with only for a few for a year. He, he emailed me and said, Jessica, if you could use a change pace, I just built this new winery on Warden Hill Road and I have extra space. So you're welcome to move in. And I said, thanks so much, but I can't handle any change. And I told that to Bill Hatcher and he said, no, 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 no. You, you, I will make my, you will go next week and I will go with you. It doesn't matter when it is, you just tell me. And you at least need to talk to him and figure out what this means. So I, we went and I said, Bill, what do, you, what do you mean? And he said, I have no idea. All I know is I've got something. If you need a change of pace and a clean start, you're welcome to do that here. Right. And it's been a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, no, I can, it's, uh, that's one of the things I really love about the Oregon wine community is yes. everybody has one another's backs, no matter what. Yes, so when we say that we're a collaborative region or industry, this is, these are examples of that. Exactly. That when the chips are down, you know you can rely on your community to be selfless in saying, this may not help me, but right. I have something I can give to you. Right, that's, it's just beautiful. Uh, and this, if I remember correctly, and when emailed back and forth over the mm -hmm. summer, uh, this was the first year that you released your Bubbles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so how did Bubbles Monday with you and your <laughs> dad start? <laughs> Great question. So at the time, I, so I, I still had my, I think I may have, at that time, oh, I know what happened. So I had been in biotechnology. My dad and I started the winery. I thought it was going to be on the side. Right. Um, that I would continue with biotechnology. But I was totally passionate about biotechnology, um, which I can come back to later. And um, so I thought it would be on the side. So we did that for five years. And then 
sometime in there, when I was really, well, when Mondays were different than they are to me now, um, you know, Mondays are hard for most people. Yes. You just got to get in it and blah, 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 blah. Well, I wanted something to look forward to. So when I was still living in San Francisco, I started Bubbly Mondays. And then when I moved up here, I said, Dad, we're going to do Bubbly Mondays. And we got together every Monday right. to have Bubbles on Monday. That's great. That's wonderful. So in, in that, I'm trying to put like a timeline together. Oh, yeah. You know, so if your sparkling came out in... 2021. Mm -hmm. Did you start it in 2016? I or? started, yeah, I started it earlier. So, well, actually, I started it after, but my dad and I had always talked about doing sparkling wine. Right. And I will be candid in saying that uh, we didn't for a long time, partially because I'm such a grower champagne freak, right. that I felt like if we couldn't make something that had a quality that I feel I would rather buy than a grower champagne at that price point, right. then I didn't think we should make it. Right. What changed is that the quality level of the Valley sparkling wines went up so quickly. Yes, very much so. Over, yeah. the, over the summer, you know, I think I tasted over 40 different you know, sparklings you know, from Oregon, uh, and there were still others that were left off the, that yeah. didn't get a chance to try but like yours it was like easily within the top 10 of, of everything that I tasted I loved it it was absolutely gorgeous thank you You're welcome. it's uh it's you know I think what I wanted to do w with it was and this is a theme for me okay. um with essentially all our non pinot so for Viognier Rosé and sparkling this is the theme that I want a style that has clarity and transparency and that is bright, and I'm not afraid of high acid. Um, and so I guess that just pairs with things I like to eat, right. and it pairs with the things that I kind of enjoy. So that was the intention. Yes. It, it's, I loved it. I was like, wow, this is amazing. That was really nice. Um, so you're talking about life memories, yeah. right? Uh, when you visit your website, you know, you have the, the drone footage of the vineyard and it cuts, you know, to you and Gabriella uh, mm -hmm. hopping through the vineyard. And then there's another shot of, you know, a higher uh, picture of the vineyard and you can see two little people. And then you can see this one little person, I assume it's Gabriella, mm -hmm. she's either pointing up at the drone or like waving at the drone or something. And to me, that would be, I, I look at that. And it just totally encompasses all of your story and everything. And, you know, that day in the vineyard, you know, doing that yeah. photo shoot, is that like one of those moments? Absolutely. I mean, I feel so. So first of all, all credit for that goes to Andrea Johnson, who I have known for years. And she right. understands our story. And she understands what moments I care about. Right. And she just happened to catch it. And um, so credit goes to her. But absolutely, I feel really lucky that I get to share this. You know, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I had this bond with my dad. Right. And now I get to share a bit of it with Gabriella. I mean, she's six, so it's too soon to know whether this is going to end up being what she wants to do. And I don't want her to feel that pressure. Right. But what I do know is that I'm inspired by her. And I'm inspired by trying to create something for her generation and that I love the moments that I have with her. You know, she loves coming to vineyards with me. Doesn't matter the weather. Right. When we're gonna go check out a vineyard, she wants to be there, particularly in the past year, we've gone to look, we've um, started to work with two new vineyards and she was very eager to see them and get to know them and. That's amazing. Yeah. Can I ask what the two? Yeah. Yeah, so we, um, for our sparkling program for this year, which we started a, a rather, well, a much larger program, so it won't be ready for, I think one, we'll see, but right, right, right. three to four years. Right. Um, we started with Eola Springs Vineyard in the Eola Amity Hills for Chardonnay for that. Okay. And then also I will be in 2022, um, we've signed a contract for Gamay. Um, Front, which is the first time I'm making Gamay. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> from Cherry Grove Vineyard, uh, which is, yeah. used to be in the Yamhill Carlton AVA, and right. now, but, yeah. 
that's awesome. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, GMA is like starting to get a, a name, you know, in the area, and just it's it's a it's a fun little variety to, yeah. to play with. Yeah, I'm gonna have fun doing it. Um, so. Yeah. No, that would be. That would be fun to learn. <laughs> yes. Um, So you, uh, going back to um, be behind the label, yeah. or uh, back of the envelope, mm -hmm, my apologies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the Pinot Noir auction this year, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I think that was, it, it played a perfect part in your story, and you decided to um, use the uh, Le Pavillon vineyard and the mm -hmm. vineyard, um, you know, contrasting, you know, bright fruit and dark fruit and was it just like when you were doing that, were you um, going to that with an intention or were you like kind of like barrel sampling and then it kind of happened? And... I had an intention. So first of all, I was so nervous about the auction. I sat on the sidelines and didn't participate for a few years because I was like, oh, I mean, we've been around for a while, but we're a small brand. We don't have a lot in distribution. What if nobody bids on it? What if... Nobody. Right. It's like the typical, you know, middle right. school. What if nobody picks me for the team? Oh, no. I'm picked last. That's awful. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. So I was very intimidated. But, um, it, yeah, no, I, I kind of wanted to, something to be representative of the potential of the Valley. And I felt that if we had two different regions represented, that it might do that. And typically you would think that, um, that if you were going to pick... Dundee Hills and Yamhill Carlton, that it would be bright red fruit right. from the from the Dundee Hills and it's kind of the deeper, darker intensity from the um, Yamhill Carlton district. But in my case, it's flipped um, with these two particular sites, and I thought that that was kind of fun. That is. So um, at my particular block at Bearsing Vineyard, which is at the top of the hill right near the tasting room and is all Danesville, it tends to be really bright, red fruit, elegant have a restraint to it, almost some floral in the nose. Right. Um, and then La Pavillon Vineyard, which is on Warden Hill Road, um, just happens to be blackberry, briary, brambly. And so I thought, well, that's kind of fun because it's combining the potential of the valley, but in a way that might be unexpected. Right. And it is, I mean, I didn't get to try it or anything, but it is unexpected to bring those two together and for them to be flip-flopped. And that was really great. Um, so coming from a biotech mm -hmm. background, you know, your dad being a software developer, um, would you consider wine art? I think it's both. I think that winemaking is equal parts science and art. And I think that some people come into it with a scientific perspective and some people come into it with an artistic right. perspective. For me, and this is, my dad and I did this as well. Right. Uh, for me, I come into it with a scientific framework and an analytical approach because that's how I approach everything. So an example of that is that I start blending. First of all, um, every stage of the winemaking process, my dad and I would always meet first with right. whomever our staff was at the time, you know, seller interns and, and harvest interns. And we would start with, okay, what are the strengths and weaknesses of what we have? What do we anticipate about the vintage? And how do, what's our game plan? Right. What, what are our objectives? And then we can kind of back into how we do that. And so we start with that approach. And then when I start blending trials, I actually start with a spreadsheet, which is that I start with, here's my input and what's my output. So my input is the barrels that I have, how many do I have? What are the you know percentage one, first year old, percentage second year old, percentage blah, 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 blah. Right. So I start with an inventory of what we have, and then I create an output based on what excites me. What do I think will sell, and what would excite me? Right. And I start with some quantifiable targets, which are X number, you know, between X and Y, number of barrels of this, da, 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 da. But then you start tasting, and that goes out the window, because you really need to follow the art side of it. Right. So I would say I start with science and I end and I deviate <laughs> with art, right. you know, but then I have a lot of winemaker friends who don't have that, that are more on the art side completely. Right. It is. Um, and out of curiosity, 
you know, so diving more and more into that art side of things, mm -hmm. or, for, you know, art for winemaking. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any other aspects of your life where you're, like, tingling and um, exercising that part of your brain? Yeah, I think that um, I always, before I started making wine, I always wanted something. It was painting, I used to paint, I always, I enjoy writing. So I always had some creative outlet. Right. Um, but I, I think it's so much more comfortable and familiar to me to go on the analytical side. <sighs> I'm right there. Yeah, I would imagine, given right. what you do. And right. so I relate to that because, um, you know, my dad had that background. I have that background. Right. So it's so much more comfortable to me. Uh, but I think, and, and so I don't think I could have made that transition to starting with analysis and then allowing yourself to be led astray had I not been through some of the life experience. I couldn't have done it when I was younger. No, I, I, yeah, no, you gotta, you got to have a certain comfort in your skin yeah. to even allow that to happen. Yeah, and a certain amount of experience to say, even if I don't have the perfect quantifiable proof, right. I believe this is the right way to go. Yes. No. And trust your intuition. So I, I know Gabrielle is only like six or seven. Mm -hmm. um, so like my daughter, right? Yeah. Uh, her mom and myself, we're both techie geeks. I feel sorry for my daughter. She is just going to like be a, a techie nerd geek, and it just it shows. But uh, maybe that's why she's so into ballet. It could be right. Uh, and asking her like, "What do you want to do?" And she's like, "I really want to go to like NASA or SpaceX." Cool. And I'm like, "Yeah, that's great." And I, you know, at, at 13, I asked, you know, she was like, and then I asked like, "Well, what about dance?" Mm -hmm. And she's like. I know it's not a forever thing, and um, I know I could be a teacher or whatever, but like, it's dance isn't like going to be around all the time. Mm -hmm. Can you see like in Gabriella any signs that she might be going on the more technical side or more on the artistic side or? So, um, ever since a young age, she is. I, I don't want to. Feel like hesitant to say this because I don't want to hold her back. Right, right. But right, my right. perception is that she has always felt much more comfortable with math and science. And she will ask me two nights ago. She said, "Mommy, mommy, let's go home and do an experiment." And I said, "Well, what experiment did you want to do?" And she said, "Well, first we can look at the book, but then I have some other ideas." So she loves cool. it, and I probably cultivate that a lot because I love that curiosity. Right. That sort of curiosity can never be replicated. You can't no. you can't train that in a person or a child. Or right. You can't go to school for yep. like, oh let's go learn curiosity. It yep. just, just doesn't happen. Yep. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean she used to say, so she was a she was born prematurely. Uh, she was born she's my miracle child. Um, I was uh, 42 when I got pregnant with her and I had already failed many um, many many years of fertility treatment and um, been told I could never have a child and I got pregnant with her and so she's my absolute miracle child she was born two months early and so we spent the first month of her life living in the NICU together and um, so we are still very connected to the NICU where we were Providence Portland Right. I swear, like half of our NICU nurses are wine club members here. I go every Christmas to, on Christmas Day, to drop off wine for the um, for the nurses that are working. Right. And um, we participated in a clinical trial recently to give sort of the patient and caregiver perspective to redesigning the NICU process. And so we're still really actively involved. So she tells me that she wants to be a neonatologist which I love, wow. but we'll see what she wants to do. Then yes. she'll turn around and say, but really I want to be a winemaker just like my mommy. Yes, I want to go explore Europe and yep. Yep. go and, over. Yep. And she says, "You, I'm going to be the winemaker and you're going to watch my baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh darn. Yeah, that's great. That, that is awesome. <laughs> um, all right, I know that um, you have another, another meeting here shortly. Oh my gosh, time goes by so quickly. Yeah, so. I just have some rapid fire questions yeah. and then I'll do the reveal on the wine. Okay. And then we can kind of wrap things up. That sounds great. Okay. Uh, favorite 
musical artist to listen to during Argus? Whitney Houston. Your favorite indulgent food? Nachos. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. No, no, no. There's, there's no one and Kyle spinach artichoke dip. Oh, Kyle does some amazing <laughs> stuff. Oh my gosh. Uh, if you could choose a superpower of any sort, what would it be? To hold time static. No. Oh, okay. Uh, your hardest notes are they digital or handwritten? Both. Uh, the the meaningful ones are absolutely digital. It's no shock, a big spreadsheet, <laughs> but um, I often write things down and shove them in my pocket so that right. I can go home at the end of the day and put them in my spreadsheet. Okay. Oh, uh, your favorite superhero? Superhero. I have to think about that. Okay, that's fair. Uh, well, I think I would have to say Wonder Woman. Okay. Because well, when I was a kid, I used to run around thinking right. that I could be Wonder Woman. You are Wonder Woman. <laughs> I mean, if you look at everything that you do, right? I mean, you're running a winery, you're a single mom, and you're doing all the winemaking. I mean, come on. I'm sure you get, what, like three or four hours of sleep a night or no, something? No, I'm actually a good sleeper now. I used, to, okay. I used to be a very bad sleeper. But one of the things that has... Can I go on a meandering tangent? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I, I actually do sleep really well. And one of the reasons is that, you know, when I left biotech, I thought, I felt, it took me a while. So we started the winery in 2003. I didn't leave my job until 2008. Right. And um, one of the reasons was that I felt confused or guilty about the fact that I was working on bringing products to the market drugs that would help cancer and autoimmune diseases. And I was so focused on the patients that right. I thought, how can I go from that to making wine? That doesn't seem like I'd have this big connection to um, changing the world. Right. And what I've found is that actually we can all make our own little community and our own little world better by living exactly the way we want to and by creating the culture that we want in our work environment, in our family environment, and that we can, you can't change the whole world, but you can change your little world. And so as a result of that, I think that um, I'm really comfortable with where we are. You know, we have a team that is very committed to, we started putting up on all of our bottles now, that are committed to sustainable winemaking, diversity and equity, and our community. Right. And Therefore, I sleep better. When you're making a difference and you have a name out in the, in the community of being a super nice person, that has to feel so nice at night. It does. I mean, I feel like everything... A couple of years ago, I, um, we had a staff meeting and I looked around and I realized that only one person was there when it was my dad and I. And so I wrote the AP Ethic, which is just sort of five statements of what I think wine should be right. and why we're doing it. And if it doesn't align with that, we ought not to do it. So one of them is, you know, we are, as a winery, we're inevitably tied to our land, seasons, and community, and it's, it's our responsibility to leave it all in a better place. Um, you know, the name of our winery is still AFE, so I'm focused on organizations that make things better for all of our daughters, right. yours too, and that means supporting community, well, winemaking practices and community organizations that make the world a better place. That's beautiful, that's great. All right, one last yeah. rapid fire question. That was not rapid, sorry, that <laughs> no, was like a... <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, we're totally fine. Oh, what was the last book you read? Oh, uh, I'm reading, um, well, right now I'm reading Ruth Ozeki. I love fiction. Okay, so. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Should we reveal the wine? Yes. All right. I, can I guess? Yes. Okay. I gotta stand up here. No, I don't. I mean, it has such pretty citric notes, and yet right. that's supportive. I was, well, Do you I was want gonna to, ask so, if it was the lingua franca. Very interesting. Okay, so this is Arlen. Oh my gosh, my competition! <laughs> <laughs> but Tama 
is the winemaker. Oh my gosh. So. It's so bright and pretty. Yeah, so that's the 2019 All My Darlings uh, Chardonnay from Ireland. Oh, and so uh, it's amazing that you said Lingua Franca because Tama is, is the winemaker. It's really pretty. Well yeah. done. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it with yes, me. Yes, no, thank you for taking your time out today. And, you know, it's a holiday season, so, you know, I'm sure you're running around crazy. So it's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes.